Shalom Aleichem and welcome to this continuing series of Who and What is Jesus for the Jews? Now in this segment we're going to be looking at the claims of Jesus as the Hebrew Messiah, the Hebrew Mashiach as it were in Hebrew. And one of the things I want to just briefly cover since there is a, a new book that has been written by a, an Orthodox uh, Chabad rabbi or former Chabad rabbi, Shmoli Boteak, who is well known in the uh, Christian evangelical circles, who's done, he's published many, many books. And I think it's something that has created an uproar, especially within the Orthodox community from which we are in, because even uh, we've heard several um, uh, speaking engagements that he was to have, uh, even within the circles he, that he used to belong to, canceled because of the title of the book, Kosher Jesus. This obviously has uh, hit many different areas and is causing a lot to talk about um, because, of course, the book uh, makes reference of Jesus as a kosher potential Messiah. And I want to address this very clearly because a lot of people, especially from the Orthodox world, feel that this is an invasion and is really breaching the fences, the yagims, of what the rabbis had said regarding this person. And one of the things we need to understand that the world is right now going through a major change in its theological and uh, philosophical points of view and understanding. Actually, there's a lot of truth coming out in, in the Christian world in particular, the Messianic world, uh, also are beginning to understand that what they understood previously is not the case. Um, interesting enough, about a week ago, a show on a national Christian television station, uh, TBN, had Dr. Roy Blizzard, who happens to be uh, a director of a, an organization called Yavo Ministries, trying to find out or trying to uh, bring forth the Jewish roots of Jesus. Now, statements that he made on this national network was one that was, for myself, very surprising. Even to allow such statements go out on such a network where millions, if not billions, of Christians are listening is something that we need to understand and reflect that even the Christian world is now having to challenge or become challenged by the notion that what they previously, uh, previously understood as truthful Christian theology is now coming apart by all seams. In other words, the Christian faith is in crisis is an internal philosophical and theological crisis because everything that they have taught from the very beginning is now t coming apart from each end. Now whether you believe this what I say or not the fact is that this information is being uh, informed throughout the whole world through such medias and through such scholars to such an extent that Dr. Roy Blizzard mentioned that there's going to be a group of scholars meeting in Austin, Texas this year, 2012, in order to discuss the major ramification that this will have on the Christian church, Messianic groups in general. What does that mean for you, my friend, who are involved in the Messianic movement or Jews involved in the Hebrew Christian movement? This means that there's going to be a radical change in, in challenge among your own constituency or people of faith that's attending your congregations. Obviously this means that there's a real call to come back to Judaism. At least a Judaism that was practiced in the first century in which Jesus himself espoused. Obviously this message is very very dynamic and it's a challenge to Christians as well as Jews involved in the, the Jewish Hebrew Christian or Messianic movements. Now when I say this, this is something, nothing, it's nothing new. This idea of a kosher Jesus, uh, as Shmuley Boteach presents, and somewhat, I don't agree everything in his book, but nevertheless, the premise of the fact that this person, whether you believe he was uh, true in history or not, has created an, an incredible uh, movement towards people coming back to Judaism, or that faith which was once believed to be the foundational faith of the Christian movement. Jesus was the son of the covenant of the Brit and he be behaved as ardently as a religious and practicing Jew of his time. In other words, we could probably label him in our standards as an Orthodox Jew. I would even dare say 
perhaps as a Hasidic Jew of his time. Henry Daniel Ropes, who is a distinguished French Catholic scholar, who was responsible for this particular citation or statement, made it clear why no Christians can truly understand his own faith until he also understands the Judaism which Jesus practiced. And this is, in fact, the core center of the idea of the kosher Jesus. When he began his ministry, says this French Catholic priest, in what context did he do so? And what were her, who was her, his helpers, his collaborators? The physical context was that the Jewish land, the land of Israel, which he practically never left in all his many journeys, his disciples and 12 shluchims, or emissaries, apostles, were all Jews, most of them peasants, fishermen from Galilee. Their names alone show that they were of Jewish origin. Simon, Shimon, John, Yohanan, Jude, Yehuda, and Judas, or Yehudas, Levi, and who was to be also known as Matisyahu, and others or Matai, as they would call him. When he spoke, his style was so impregnated with Jewish mannerisms and expressions that the rhythm and the balance and the repetition of the alliteration of Hebrew poetry are also felt even in the Greek manuscripts of the Gospel. Just as his parables, we are aware that the same manner of thought as which he produced the Midrash, the midrash of Israel, the rabbinical literature, is also felt in his statements. But it was not only by birth or breeding or manner of life or friendship and means, says this French Catholic scholar, the expression that Jesus as a man was a Jew and so holy a Jew. He was also a Jew that he recognized that his people had a particular mission and destiny entirely of their own. He, like all his countrymen, were son of the covenant. In other words, better even yet stated, as he said to the Samaritan woman, that the salvation is of, possessive, the Jews. Which means that the message of eternal salvation does not come from one person, but the collective nation of Israel. And here we find the concept of the Hebrew Messiah. What his position is within that collectiveness what does he represent in that sense of that collectiveness? And who, in fact, is this Messiah? Christian missionaries to the Jews and Messianics, who are always reaching out to the Jews for the message, don't want to shock the Jews by handing out leaflets which proclaim Jesus is God. This belief is kept by the declaration of Jesus being our own Hebrew Messiah. So in many of the books, just like we mentioned and will be mentioning, like Dr. Uh, Michael Brown in his four or five series sets, he always meshes between Messiah and God as if they were one and the same thing. After all, if Jews are waiting for the Messiah, the Mashiach, maybe Jesus is he. But Jews are not waiting for God. Consequently, the missionary merely declares Yehoshua ben Yosef is the Mashiach. He being the God, the Son of the, those who hold to the Trinity, part of the Trinity, is advanced to potential converts later. In other words, it's part of the indoctrinational part of the church. The full page ads of the so-called Jews for Jesus or uh, Jews who, who follow their Rebbe Yehoshua ben Yo uh, Yosef <laughs> tend to dress Jesus in the gowns of an Orthodox Jew, which in fact, historically speaking, we have to accept that fact. He was a Jew within the milieu of Orthodoxy or observance. And this is why many Christians and Messianics have trouble understanding this Jesus. This Jesus was in fact kosher. Yes, my friends, kosher. Kosher in his, his way of life. He may have gone apart in some areas, but still there were areas where you might say he was still covered by halacha and its interpretations. The scripture evidence presented in, in, in this video 
is that he believed in the God of the unity of the Hebrew Scripture. In other words, that the Tanakh, what is called the Torah, the writings of the prophets, and the writings in general, were part of God's given message or word to the Jewish people. The concept of the Trinity does not affect Jews whatsoever because it has no basis in Hebrew in the Hebrew Bible. However, Jews are deeply concerned about the Hebrew Messiah. Our scriptures are filled with words of messianic expectation. Our Jewish soul wait for him daily, part of the, of the Maimonides Creed. The question is of interest is whether Christianity's Christ, that is to say, the Messiah, uh, the Hebrew Messiah, is in fact the one. Have Jews, have Jews neglect, neglected to recognize Jesus is their Messiah because Christianity has claimed him to be the son, of, the God, the Son? After all, it might be that if we separated the Christological Christ or Messiah from the Jewish Jesus, we would find we're looking straight at the Mashiach of the Hebrews. In other words, let's put the claims of Christianity and let's try to discover if Jesus fits the role, not of a Christian Christ, but rather of a Jewish Messiah, as Judaism understands him from our own scriptures. And let's look at the attributes of the Messiah and the Messianic era and expectations as presented in the Hebrew Bible. Then we can ascertain if Jesus fulfilled the Messianic requirements and if he indeed is the Mashiach of the Jewish people. This becomes the foundational uh, difference of position between those who believe that the Messiah has not yet come, has not come in the flesh yet, and those who say, oh yes, he has, he was Jesus, and some other Orthodox group would probably claim, no, it was not Jesus, it was someone else named so-and-so. Clearly, if this role was not that of the Messiah as expressed in the written Word of God, the Hebrew Scripture, what Christianity has made the Messiah, is not Judaism's concern. As Michael Brown says in his book, if Jesus is not the Messiah, neither Jew nor Gentile should follow him. I would agree with him. I agree that Jews and Gentiles should follow Judaism. However, it certainly would be of great concern and importance to us if, he, if the performance that, were, that he did was of the expected Messiah. And thus, we should be obligated to follow him if, in fact, he was the Messiah who fulfilled the role and expectation of the Emmet, true Messiah. Has the Hebrew Messiah already come? We must use traditional interpretation of the Biblical Messiah passages to find our answer. What do you think? What do you really think we will discover here? Have our Jewish ancestors been in error through the centuries when they refused to succumb to conversion to the acceptance of a Messiah that did not fulfill the roles and prophecies of our prophets and instead suffered martyrdom and Kiddush Hashem at the hands of those who say that we were wrong? When persecution and torture and death could be avoided, we, are, we, leaned and we, we, we leaned and learned in pious fathers mistaken to remain with their Judaism? How easy could it have been just to accept conversion to Christianity? They could have prospered socially and economically and obtained peace in the diaspora of disdain and degradation for Jews. Actually surprising that so few were lost to Judaism Due to conversion, it seems utterly a sign that Judaism's remnant in dispersion remains steadfast, even when offered the choice of the Christian cross or the Christian curse. We find in these pages that Jews have rejected Jesus, be him the God in the flesh of, I would call, Caesar's Messiah, or as Rabbi Rabbi. Um, Shmuley Boteach suggests in his book Kosher Jesus that he was a kosher potential Messiah of his time who failed. Be it as it were, the Hebrew Messiah, because of our intimate and profound knowledge of the Holy Scripture, together with our devotion to the God of Israel, we must come to a determination whether he fit the bill of the Messiah and whether he fulfilled the role of the expected Messiah. 
Scripture passages are basis of the basis of Judaism's understanding of the Messiah and messianic expectation. Much must be fulfilled. Much must be established. The standard in which the potential Messiah must fulfill is great, in which up to this day no claimant of the Messiah has fulfilled all of the requirements, including the most recent one. The Messiah's tasks are still to be accomplished. Christianity has tried to avoid the unfulfilled messianic hopes of either minimizing them or changing them to fit their Christological understandings. When this could not be done, the advance of the time of fulfillment to a second coming, or, let me put it call this way, I'm not going to use the word second coming because it's too vague, a second appearance. Well, it must be understood that the biblical foundations of the messianic hope cannot be disregarded or changed to suit Christianity's circumstances, or in this case, any other orthodox or ultra-orthodox um, agenda. It must be understood that their belief that Jesus is Messiah has to measure up to the verses as written in the Hebrew Scriptures. Expectation must be satisfied as written. After all, this is where the hope of the Messiah originated. If we find the messianic expectation unfulfilled in traditional terms, other terms will not do. What God says will occur is exactly what will occur. God said it clearly, repeated it in the, his holy book. However, what is to occur when expected, What is to, what, which is at the arrival of the Messiah? The Messiah's achievement cannot legitimately be placed forward to a future time. In other words, a second appearance, a second coming. The reason I say second appearance, and I'm going to say this very, very quickly because we're going to look at this passage in, in Daniel chapter 12 where the inference by Rashi makes reference of a second appearance. Not coming, but appearance. He will appear, disappear, and reappear. But this is while he's physically alive on earth, not taken out. By now, it should be of no surprise to you to learn that no such arrival in order to accomplish the Messianic era, as it is written, took place. The surprise do not describe a Messiah coming or dying or achieving or leaving or returning and then making uh, the Messianic time a reality. Nowhere is it said that the Messiah is to return after having once failed in doing what the, mes the Messiah is to do. A second coming as as, it's, Christolo as, as it, it's taught in the Christological uh, understanding, uh, is just a buy of time and have no absolute foundation in Judaism's Bible. Such a second coming is anticipated only in the New Testament, and we shall have to examine this error, which was part of the error that took place since the Messiah had failed to realize what was expected of his time. Now here we go to see other failed movements in history that in order to cope with the loss of the Messiah figure, they had to be forced into believing that he would reappear soon. Consequently, if the scriptural expectations for the Messiah are unfulfilled and no second coming is propounded, it would appear that Christian Messiah, Christ, or Mashiach, uh, are two different entities altogether. Now let's read carefully the Hebrew Bible and the passages about the Messiah and see if it fits, uh, if it fits Jesus in any of these messianic expectations. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. One like the Son of Man, Ben Adam, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancients of days. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9 through 10. The king cometh unto thee, he is just, and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and he shall speak peace unto the heathens. His dominion shall be from sea, even to sea, and from river, even to the ends of the earth. Now, it seems kind of curious that these two different appearances of the Messiah are depicted in the Bible 
and as interpreted by Christianity. But actually, Daniel describes the Messiah's arrival before God in heaven, not on earth. Read it again. The arrival can be described fancifully, as in Zechariah, but it lacks the relevance of messianic expectations. What is completely relevant is that what it, it achieves. Both in Daniel and Zechariah, it agrees that the Messiah is to have an earthly kingdom, whose dominion shall be throughout the world. It shall be a non-ending kingdom, teaching peace. The Messiah will have great honor in the service from all people. He will save people from Israel from unduly troubles. These are not descriptions of the Messiah and his rule. Note that Jesus does not fit these descriptions because it, he did not rule a kingdom of earth. Just the contrary, it entered into the realm of the spiritual. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. But the Messiah's kingdom is a Messiah that brings the heavenly realm into the earthly realm. So thus, my friends, the messianic kingdom is in and of this world. Note that Jesus did not fit these descriptions because he did not rule a, a kingdom on earth. Also, note that nothing is said about the coming on the way on an ass, leaving, dying, and returning on another way. Further, understanding Christianity's interpretation, notwithstanding, there is no Christologic otherworldly kingdom spoken here in either verses. The Messianic kingdom is depicted as earthly and interpreted as such in Judaism. It is so interpreted because this is precisely what is written. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, The God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Here we have a divine intervention establishing on a permanent basis a dynasty and a rulership that comes from God. And it shall stand forever. It will remain forever. Where? That's the question that begs to be asked from chapter 2, verse 44. Daniel chapter 7, verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever and ever. Psalms chapter 89, verse 3 to 4. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8, verse 12 and 13. Also look at 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verses 7, verses 11 through 12 and verse 14. Say unto my servant David. Interesting word, servant, because we're going to see that used a lot when it makes refer reference to Kalal Israel, to all of Israel in Isaiah. But in this case, the very representative of Kalal Israel is the Mashiach, is the king. David, I took thee to be a ruler over my people, over Israel. And I will set up thy seed after thee. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Now, God will create a kingdom which will last for all the time. In it, the Messiah and those after him will rule his chosen people, Israel. The Messiah is to build the temple for God, which will be for everlasting, as the kingdom will be uh, everlasting. Note, there's no such kingdom created. There is no such temple built, and Jesus did not make this happen. You should also notice that the Messiah himself is not to exist forever. It is his kingdom that will last forever, not he. And it is given that the saints of the Most High, which are Israel's people, will eventually self-rule. That is what these passages are saying. And nevertheless, we find such messages from the Christian gospel. An example, when Jesus went to the, to the temple and met there the Pharisees, and he said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I shall bring it back up. Now, obviously, the ancient manuscripts of the Greek of the Gospel of Matthew that mentions this, this interaction between Jesus and, and the Pharisees has the comments of the author not in it. What am I saying? I'm saying, my friends, 
that there was a hand, a scribal hand, that added the interpretation of what that verse was to mean for future Christians. It was a add-on. It was an insertion by the Christian scribes who then you'll find in your, your King James versions or New International Version that says, and by this he meant of his death and resurrection. So obviously he had not died nor been raised, so what was written in there was post death and or resurrection, which means it was after the whole incident took place. So obviously this is a, a commentary, a biased one at that, of what was the actual interchange between Jesus and the Pharisees. If we remove that, we'll understand the actual statement and the expectations of the Jews at that time that they expected the temple to be destroyed. And what he said had an immediate impact that he was going to build the third temple as soon as it was going to be destroyed because he was present and he assumed to be the potential Messiah. So obviously the day of the destruction would be the day of the birthing or the birth of the Messiah. In either case, he missed the opportunity. Thus, could not be the Messiah that was promised. But let's continue. Numbers chapter 24, verse 17 and 19. And there shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Out of Jacob shall come that shall have dominion. Now, interesting enough, about a hundred or, or, or within the, the contemporary period of Jesus arose another potential Messiah, which was hailed by Rabbi Akiba to be the actual Messiah because he took over Jerusalem from the Romans and ruled two years. He, in fact, had a kingdom that was being established. But why did Rabbi Akiba say that, he, in fact, he had committed an error? Because his kingdom was not standing. In other words, his, this, this Messiah figure that proclaimed himself to be the Messiah, uh, believed to be also of the descendant of David, had failed to maintain his kingdom. He died. It was brought under after two years. My friends, it was supposed to be an eternal kingdom. And thus, because death puts an end to the claimant of Messiah, so too death put the end of the claimant of Jesus as a Messiah. But wait a minute. Interesting enough, he did not die. Or so it says. He's alive. So thus he still can have a potential chance. Here is where we find the birthing or the, uh, the seedling of the Yehi movement within the Jewish groups. To try to maintain a persona that is still alive while he's physically dead. Now, as you're going to be listening to, to this series, you're going to understand that when you study the Christian Bible, you're going to understand that, in fact, if you go into the Greek, Jesus, in fact, did not resurrect from the dead. Um, and I'm going to show that to you in Matthew chapter 26, verse 35, where the Greek word specifically says, Agados, which Agados means in Greek to stand up, that he stood. It doesn't mean that he came back from the dead. It's as if to say he basically recovered from his injuries or his wounds. That would be a more proper understanding of the Greek word in context of what he had suffered. Thus, those who say he actually died, he didn't die then. And with their sources to indicate at a later time he may have died. But let's leave that point for a later discussion. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 10 and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people and it shall the Gentiles seek and the rest shall be glorious now interesting enough it says from there there will be a you might say a branch a stump that will come out of the root of, of Jesse who happened to be the descendant of David uh, and shall stand as a sign an ought for the people and it's interesting this was referring to the Jewish people because later it says and to it shall the Gentiles seek in other words the nations of the world shall seek after that and his rest shall be glorious now I'm going to give right here some credit to the Jesus the kosher Jesus for one second and I'm going to do this uh, on a very big risk here why am I saying this because um, I had a very interesting discussion 
with a Christian, a Christian the person in my office, and he said whether he was for real or he wasn't for real, Jesus, for us Gentiles, was the best thing that ever happened to us. Now, interesting enough, the fact that by most Jews, by many Orthodox Jews, Jesus was a blip in the historical page. Yet for the Gentiles, whether it was by a whole entire reinvention as portrayed by Caesar's Christ, Caesar's Messiah, where it was all a, a plot by Caesar to bring the Messianic movement under control and therefore recreated perhaps a persona in history in order to suit his political agenda, which you can read that in the book Caesar's Messiah, which he bases himself strongly on, on Josephus' historical analysis of the political aspect, which has a lot of foundational truth there. Or you believe that in fact this person in history was just um, a figment of the imagination, a recreation out of nothing. The bottom line is there is a consequence to these things. And these consequences is in fact the Gentile world, the world at large, has now and is now looking at this Jew of history or figment of imagination to be, to an extent, the Savior, their personal Savior, and they recognize him as a Jew. So my Jewish friends, let's not be so intellectually dishonest. There is elements here that we have to grapple with and the dishonesty to try to just whitewash in order to win an argument is not a good way to go into the truth or to seek after the truth. So obviously here we find that the Messiah potential will seek, the Gentiles will seek after him and it shall rest and his rest shall be glorious. In other words, that all the nations of the world, now interesting enough, we've seen that of recent history another Jew who has taken the swarm of the whole world, an impetus which has brought many non-Jews to convert to Judaism or to assume the Noahide movement. But we don't hear anything similar in contrast to the other. In other words, if you would compare uh, Jesus and Lachavdi, if we compare, uh, say, the Rebbe of Lababich, you will see that asking the Gentile people, do you know the Rebbe of Lababich? Do you know Jesus? I would say that most Gentiles will say, I know Jesus. Yes, he's a Jew. Why am I saying this? Because in either case, there are many similarities. But when it comes down to this Pasuk, without a question, the one who has had more influence over the nations has been this Caesar's Messiah, even though it's a figment. But even this, the Rambam says, will work for the eventual good of the true Messiah. Because after all, no one, or at least the majority of the people that I know, has never seen Jesus. Except one that I know. But in that case, you have to ask yourself, who do you follow? And here, clearly, it's, it's, it's taught very, very clear that, in fact, if we're talking about which Jew most people have followed, most people, most people of the nations, we have to be honest and say it was Jesus. But even that, as you will see, becomes completely dismissed when you see that his kingdom was not an eternal kingdom. It was not permanently here on earth. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints, the Sadiqims of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Now, all countries and people will look to the Messiah. Of the Hebrew people will serve him. And here's where I talk about it, that no matter how you look at it, the Orthodox Jewry is still a win-win situation for the Jews. Note that besides Jesus' lack of rule over an earthly kingdom, he never had dominion under him, serving and obeying him. Muslim, Hindus, Buddhists certainly are not under his rule in this world or any other world. 
In fact, not only was he not served by the nations, but the Romans put him to death. Not only was he not obeyed and the glorious, but Jesus' death was apparently against his own desire and certainly inglorious, hanging between two thieves. And later, think about this, later having his whole entire image and reputation completely distorted by Rome. But like I said earlier, even this Gamzula Tova is for a good. And Rambam speaks of that good. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 through 2 and verse 4 through 5. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his root, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. With righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth which with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be his girdle of his loins, and the faithfulness of the girdles of his reins. In Jeremiah we read, In those days at that time I will cause a branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall ex execute judgment and righteousness in the land. The Hebrew Messiah will properly administer God's desire for human beings' goodness and virtue. He will, with excellence, judge, rebuke, punish evildoers in this world. He will perform justice and righteousness for the poor and the meek. That designation of his rule is the earth and in the land eliminates entirely Christianity's interpretation of a heavenly judgment. And plainly Jesus was not then and is not now in the land righteously judging the messianic kingdom on earth as it's described. In addition, it can be said in any rational manner that God, the Son of the Trinity, possesses the fear of the Lord when he is supposed to be the self-same in the unity. How could that be? If he's supposed to fear the Lord, how can he be also Lord? Psalms chapter 72, verse 7. In his day shall, be the right, shall righteous flourish in abundance of peace so long as the moon endures. Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of, them, of him that bringeth good news, that publishes peace, shalom, and brings good tithing of good. The published salvation, it says unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. God rules, my friends. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be of, shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon the kingdom to order it and to establish it with e e judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever and ever. In the thriving kingdom of, of the Messiah, there will be endless peace and justice. My friend, during the life of Jesus, there was no peace. There was no justice. There was corruption everywhere he went. Many times he cried out, How many times, O children of Israel, I have tried to gather you as a chick does to the, his, the, the hens. He lamented the failure of being able to accomplish the role of the Messiah to gather in his children, the children of Israel. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, in order to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice for hence, henceforth, even forever. If the thriving kingdom Messiah there will be peace without end, justice. Jesus did not establish, my friend, peace on earth or rule over a kingdom of righteous people. The child is not the Christian Christianity's Christ child at all, who had no government. As a matter of fact, we understand that this was another child that was during the time of uh, Isaiah's life. Psalms 28, verse 8, The Lord is their strength, and He is saving strength of His anointed. In other words, God saves His anointed. Jeremiah 30, verse 9, But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will ri raise up unto them. It doesn't mean resurrection. It means to bring up in their midst. The verse are presented to show that there is a clear differentiation between the Lord God 
and the Messiah. Note that Christianity has joined the two and made their Messiah God himself. Obviously, we may, must make a distinction between Christianity making Jesus God in the flesh and the concept that all of us have a little bit of God in us. God breathed in us. I'm not going to go into the difference between those who hold to the Baalatanya and those who do not hold by the Baalatanya's concept between Jews and non-Jews. But suffice it to say that clearly there is a distinction here. Psalms 89 verse 3, I have sworn unto David my servant. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 8 and 1 Chronicles chapter 17 verse 7 Say unto my servant David, Thus says the Lord God, I took thee. Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 23 through 24 And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. And the Lord will be their God, and my servant David a prince among them. Now interesting enough, if in fact Jesus was the good shepherd. He incriminates himself in the passage of Matthew chapter 26 verse 35 when he realized that he was going to be nailed. He was going to be crucified. And he said to his followers clearly this evening or, or it says, this day you will all be scandalized. Because it's fulfilled of me what is written in the prophet Zechariah, chapter 13. Making reference to that shepherd that was irresponsible with his responsibility and is smitten of God, punished by God, chastised, and those who followed him as a shepherd who happened to be a false and irresponsible shepherd will be chastened and smitten just like later in the book of Acts, it makes mention uh, these same, same words by Gamaliel, one of the Jewish leaders of, uh, of the Jewish people. And in fact, when you look at history, it's exactly what happened to the early Jewish messianic movement who happened to follow Jesus. In fact, they came to nothing. And that is where Rome picked up and usurped the power and the the linkage of what was being spoken about and changed it entirely to a different message. Ezekiel 34 verse 23 through 24 I will set up one shepherd over them and he shall feed them even my servant David and I and I the Lord will be their God and I and my servant David a prince among them. The Messiah is to function as a servant of God. Oved Hashem. He will be God's shepherd. That God and his servants are separate will be God's shepherd. Notice this. That God's bringing the Messiah into his position. Nothing is said here or elsewhere the Hebrew scriptures about the Messiah being the substance of the Lord God. Which Christianity still believes in and also many of the other messianic um, counterparts. In a previous uh, mention that we covered already, uh, Jesus as God is not a trinity. And he makes clear that. He does not hold to a trinity concept. We have shown this before in the New Testament with similar differentiation between God and Jesus himself. Nevertheless, Christianity and many messianic movements and leaders, including Michael Brown, has a blend of both of these in his book. He does not distinguish one because for him and for many others like him, they're actually one in the same. Now, interesting enough, what is now Michael Brown beginning and others like him beginning to argue? And this is where I say that a particular movement in our Jewish history has strengthened the Messianic movement by giving credence to the concept that the Ainsof and the Malchus are become one. In other words, that they inf infused into one, and in fact, Malchut, king, the king or kingdom, is infused by God himself, so that th therefore they become God in the flesh. My friends, this is nothing new. This concept, though it's now being taught as a new philosophy, really is not new. 
and I would encourage you to read closely the words of the Talmud which makes mention of this concept which was present and prevalent during the first century and the rabbis called it menut which which according to um, the professor of Jesus of Nazareth s states Joseph Klausner and one of the descendants of the Vilna Gaon he makes very clear that that concept of menut in that p passage in, in Talmud Sanhedrin makes reference to the Ma'amim ma Notrim, the belief of the, of the Nazarenes of the first century who happened to believe that the God becomes flesh, becomes present, incarnate, the very Malchus of Hashem, the Ein Sof, the Divine Essence. And this is why the lines have been blurred. My friends, the lines have been blurred not because of uh, the book of uh, Rabbi Boteach's Kosher Jesus. The line has been blurred way many years before. And it says very clearly, Isaiah 19, verse 20, And they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a Savior, and a great one, and he shall deliver them. My friends, during the time of all of the previous potential of messiahs that the Jewish people have experienced, many saviors or potential saviors have been sent. Even during the time prior to the Holocaust. And the question still remains. They did not deliver. They did not save. They did not fulfill. They've come past the history of the Jewish people as another failed Messiah. These words are very hard to the core, but as Jews we have to be realistic and not be of intellectual bias. Isaiah 55 verse 3 to 4, And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Isaiah, uh, Psalms chapter 18 verse 15 Great deliverance giveth he to his king and shows mercy to his anointed to David and to his seed forevermore. The Messiah of the Hebrew people is sent by God to rescue God's chosen people. Jews will have deliverance through the Messiah. Note that it's unfortunate but true that Christianity's Messiah has been made the cause of great troubles for the people of Israel. And rather the opposite. God's promise delivers not further oppression. Even to this day, people are afraid that what I say on Facebook will cause a, 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 an outlandish uh, backlash of repercussions to the Orthodox Jewish community. I've received many emails saying, please stop talking about this online. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 24 through 25. And David, my servant, shall bring over them. And they shall also walk in my judgment and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant. Wherein your fathers have dwelt, they have dwelt therein. Even they and their children, their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be prince forever. Could it be possible that it's going to be David himself that will be the Mashiach come back? Hmm. Interesting. Messiah as king, the Jewish people are to inherit the promised land forever. The Davidic dynasty of the Messiah is established as God's royalty for all time. And the people will follow the laws of God and do them in the Messianic kingdom. Note that for 2,000 years after Jesus, there has not been any Jewish kingdom in the promised land with the Messiah and those following, following rule, rules of the Torah. In other words, what is going to happen when the Messianic era begins with the Messiah, people are going to start keeping all of the commandments from the heart. My friends, this is an indication that Christianity or the Messianic Jews for Jesus movement or the Netzarim movement or whatever other Messianic movement that has existed through Jewish history to this day has not delivered because people are yet to accomplish all the Torah and Torah commands from the depth of the heart. 
automatically. We still have to teach and instruct. We still have to give a musr, exhortation, and encouragement to people to keep it. Because the new covenant has not been started yet. And so people are are believing that they're in the new covenant, the new Brit Chadeshah, which is something that is created from above, and all indication is nothing's happening. It is a dream that has not been yet realized. Psalms chapter 132, verse 9 through 12, and verse 15 and 17. Let thy priest be clothed in righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David, If thy children will keep my covenant, their children also sit upon the throne forevermore. I will abundantly bless her provision, and there I will make the horn of David to bud. Notice this condition. Keep the covenant. Keep the agreement. Start practicing. It's an encouragement. If we do this, God will do that. God will make the bud of David bud, flower, become real. And I will set up shepherds, notice the plurality, says Jeremiah, over them, which shall feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall thou be lacking, says the Lord. I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. My friends, where is Judah? And where is Israel? It's all throughout Galut. Jeremiah 33, verse 14 through 16. Behold, the days are coming, or days come, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda. In those days shall Yehuda be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. In the time to come, the Messiah and his Davidic descendants will rule forever over the people of Israel who will have kept God's covenant. My friends, where is Jesus' descendants? Where is the lineage of the Davidic descendants of Jesus? And other messiahs who have uh, come in the history of the Jews? The messiahs will survive, supervise and, and dispense just, just, justice and judgment in the earth. It says in the earth people will have plenty and live in abundance with no fear. Completely contrary to the current economical woes we are experiencing. They will be rescued in, in, and live in safety. These questions, does Jesus fit this picture, my friends? Or any of the failed messiahs of our history? Either then or now, have the Jewish people dwelt in sef safety and plenty? The quote states that in the time of the Messiah, the people of Israel shall dwell safely. As this is a description of the Messianic age. For the Hebrew people, it is obvious that it has not arrived. As Jesus does not fit the outline, my friends, nor the achievement, it's similarly obvious that he is not the Hebrew Messiah. No matter if he was a kosher Jew, no matter if he was an Orthodox Frum Jew, the Holy Bible is our source. Whatever else he may be in Christianity, Jesus is not the Messiah of the Hebrew Scriptures which we await for. In summary, from the biblical passages about the Messiah, it is evident that the Jews reject Jesus as the Messiah because they know he did not perform the role or accomplish the task of the Messiah. As it says, he who fulfills the role gets the kudos, the credits for having done so. So a list of all of the people that could have been, should have been, would have been in our history, no matter how great mediocre or small they have been, none as of to this recording fits the bill. None. We do not have a messianic expectation that they have fulfilled it. Neither Jews nor the earth has peace, abundance, safety, and happiness. 
the messianic era is fully explored and revealed. The real question is not why Jews do not believe in Jesus was the Hebrew Messiah, but why Christians and messianic Jews for Jesus people do when the messianic times did not unfold as prophesied in the book of God. There is really no question uh, or no answer to these questions that they can offer which can satisfy this simple question. It's clear that the Christian Christ, the Messiah, the Jesus Messiah, has sup a supposed function which differs from one of the Hebrew Bible. For the Messiah, it is very clear his role from a Jewish perspective. Christ's mission, as explained in Christianity, is to offer personal salvation through a vicarious atonement. The Messiah's mission of, of an earthly redemption is changed by Christianity into a heavenly salvation. But their belief does not concern us in this point here. We just want to make sure it's understood that Judaism's Messiah and Christianity's Messiah are not the same in essence, although they may be, there's, there may be a lot of similarities. The Hebrew Scriptures, the Messiah is Judaic, Torah observant. It is also rabbinically observant, which poses a big problem for many of those who are in the Messianic movements, in the uh, Christian churches, in the Hebrew Christian movements, because I have uh, very clear, Jesus said, that everything that the Pharisees and scribes command you, that ye shall do. And yet, we have to ask ourselves, why with these words of Jesus to to you? Why aren't you listening to him? Why aren't you listening to the Pharisees and scribes? Oh, I know. I got it. I understand what now why. The reason why, because the Pharisees and the scribes who, who basically give out the law is going to tell you, don't believe in Jesus because he's not the one that qualified. My friends, that's exactly the point. And when it comes to authority, you're going to have to ask yourself, between Jesus and the ones he said that, you, that we're to listen to, who are you going to listen to? Jesus said you're to listen to the Pharisees and the scribes. Just don't behave like them. But you have to listen to what they pr put out as what the law is. And my friends, the Pharisees and scribes legislated that belief in Jesus as the Messiah is heresy, is menut. He did not qualify. And he took many people away from as a result of his followers' teachings, his followers' followers, and those who usurped the, the movement, took it away completely from Torah, com took it away completely from rabbinical teachings of the time. And that's why it became usur, forbidden. My friends, yes, Jesus was kosher. Yes, he was observant. As far as I'm concerned, I, he was even Hasidic. But my friends, we are commanded, if you're going to follow Jesus, not to disobey the words of the Pharisees and scribes that instructs you on that level not to believe in him. But even more so, to observe the commandments, to do what the Pharisees and the scribes commanded. Which brings you to the realm that you have to accept rabbinical Judaism. Yes, my friends. And this is the crisis that many of, of you who are in the Messianic movements, in the Jews for Jesus, in the, in the, the Bet Mashiachs, and the Bet Avenus, and, and all of these other different Bet that has been created under the guise of following uh, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Yeshua Ben Yosef has to listen. You have to disconnect. You have to return back to the Jewish people. Obviously, Christ's mission, as explained in Christianity, is to offer salvation on a personal level. Messiah's mission on an earthly redemption is to change, is changed by Christianity into a heavenly salvation. The belief does not concern us in this regard in detail until later. But it's not the same concepts. The Hebrew scripture is Judaic. The early followers of Jesus did hope that he was the Messiah. 
they did follow Judaic concepts, Judaic belief of who the Messiah, when was the Messiah, and how the Messiah was to behave and believe and act. His Jewish followers fully understood the need for the Messiah to accomplish his mission of being the ruler in God's earthly messianic kingdom. I would refer you to the book of Acts, where supposedly after his alleged resurrection, he is asked by his uh, emissaries, his uh, shluchim, are you going to restore Israel at this time? His response is, don't know. Only God knows. Don't know. There's something that God knows. Meanwhile, just go teach everybody about what I've taught you. And this same, and this same Jesus that you saw take be taken, says later, will be, be brought back. He was literally swooped off to the north, or in a cloud, or a smoke. My friends, there's a lot of things that when you begin to look at it, you can understand how things were changed to hide other things. In return, he would fulfill the expectations at a second coming. Needless to say, Jesus did not return in their lifetime, as had expected by those who proclaimed that he was coming soon. As it says, Maranatha, he comes soon. Jesus did not return in their lifetime as they expected in the New Testament as reported. He was expected to return within 45 to 100 years of their existence to such an extent that Jesus even said that one of the disciples or Shluchim were not going to suffer death until he comes back in his kingdom. My friends, these are things that we're going to look at that were failed prophecies and promises. The early church had to minimize messianic expectation and orientations and postulate Jesus would return at some future unknown time, although Christians can await his return to earth imminently and have no basis for this to happen in any of the Hebrew Bibles and prophecies. Nothing at all written about a second coming to complete what a first coming is left undone. Jews also wait, but we must wait what God has promised in the Hebrew Scripture. The Messiah is to come, is, is permeated with the faith of his coming, and though he tarry, he shall surely appear. Now, I'm going to end here with this last statement. Because you're going to say to me, wait a minute, there is a mention about he will appear, reappear. You just said this, Rabbi, that there's a mention in, in, in Daniel regarding this appearance and reappearance. Yes, there is. But I want to make it very clear that when you read that, this is according to Rashi's commentary, who makes reference that the Messiah is going to appear on the scene. And then, for Jews, very similar to what happened with Moshe Rabbeinu, as we read in this week's portion, that he was found out he had to escape for his life and go out of Egypt and then come back as the redeeming Messiah. The same concept is appear in the book of Daniel where the Messiah appears to the Jewish people and then disappears for a period of time and then comes back as the saving Messiah. Now, that does not mean this is a second coming. It means that he was still physically here on earth. He was just disappeared from the community. He comes back to the community. This all happens during his lifetime, not during a, uh, a uh, separation between death and resurrection. This is later invented by Christianity, which is what makes this concept of a second coming truly a belief of the Notrim of the first century, which is considered menut. And this is why we need to understand this. This is why the rabbis and sages, in part, made it very clear that this is heresy. Now, this poses the question. If I believe that ABC is the Mashiach, and that he has come back. But I don't happen to believe like the Christians and Messianics believe that he's God in the flesh. Is that permissible for a Jew? Is that permissible? We're going to take a look at that in our next series because I think the question needs to be responded. And the question needs to be asked. Should a Jew embrace heresy at any level? Stay tuned for the next series. Shalom.